uh, what recommendations, and this kind of leads into what you just ended up with, what recommendations would you give state legislators in addressing assessment fairly? Uh, yeah, that's the, you know, the big question um, for, for all of us. And, uh, and uh, it's, I mean, it's a tough question in the sense, in, in one way, it's not a tough question. It's tough because it's complex. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, we, the part that's not tough is that most people re agree that it doesn't work. So that's an opener. Uh, even policymakers are saying that kind of assessment doesn't work. And uh, I'll just give you, uh, you know, a hint about the drivers. The first wrong driver is called academics obsession. That is to say, we are overly uh, preoccupied with assessment and testing, and that that's taking us away actually from learning. And that if you if you then switch over to what we call the right driver, the right driver is well-being and learning, which gets us inside the motivation to learn that I hinted out of some of the slides and therefore uh, requires uh, instruction. Then it's not, as, it's not as expensive, I have to say as well, uh, because you strip away a lot of the content in some ways and you, uh, and you focus on the foundational competencies that allow you to deal with a, a content in a more efficient basis. I talked to another superintendent a couple of weeks ago and he said, as soon as COVID is over, I'm not worried about loss of learning, he said as much because I know when we have our, our competencies and skills organized, we can, we can uh, make up for lost learning faster than we can make up for lost well-being. So I think that's the dynamic. Now, having said that, you need to increase formative assessment. Uh, Dylan William has talked about that. Increase formative assessment so that the relationship and the collaborative cultures we're talking about where the uh, teachers individually and collectively, this is really collective efficacy, are on top of instruction and who's learning and we, we and be building that up and, and going from there. And that, that's really important to, to do that. And if you're on top of formative assessment, then we can figure out uh, uh, external assessment better. It's got a, uh, external assessment has to be less prominent, has to zero in on uh, more, uh, you know, more important things, has to include engagement and efficacy. I think we'll see those in this new, uh, new development. So uh, there's work to be done. I know it's the most complex question, but I have that in there. Just a hint on the economy, because I want to mention this, that they're in the last uh, three years, there are, uh, they all happen to be women economists. There's four of them I can think of, have done these brilliant analysis of the last hundred years, and especially the last uh, 40 years, which basically says we have made mistakes economically by allowing uh, austerity to occur in a way where the rich got richer and the poor got poor and the middle class got poor and that we don't financially we don't have to do that we need to invest in um, in in the right infrastructure and it will pay off in financially in terms of the results and their analysis is pretty convinced scientific political analysis of this and uh, and for what it's worth uh, joe biden and uh, 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 kamala harris are uh, are, are really reflecting that. And th the notion is the next 12 to 24 months, you invest in these infrastructures, you invest in building relationships better, and then the yield economically, uh, educationally, yes, but the yield economically will be powerful. It will accelerate and it will take a couple of years. So there's a very different mindset going on now among economists about this, because it has to be part of the solution. As long as the economy is structured the way it is, it's, uh, it's fatal for uh, improvement of learning, especially in terms of equity. Thank you, Dr. Fulman. Uh, we've got several questions in the chat and what we'll do is uh, Mrs. Grimes and I will um, alternate in reading those. And so Mrs. Grimes, I'll let you read that first uh, question for Dr. Fulman that's uh, in the chat. Sure, thank you. Uh, Jim Lloyd is asking, as social emotional learning continues to rise and people are calling for it to be measured, I'm concerned that legislators will mess it up and turn a good thing into another accountability stick. Do you share these concerns? And if not, can you say why? Uh, I absolutely share them. Plus, uh, as I, I'm, I'm worried about more than just that. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, I guess one good news one could say is the commissioners have asked me to talk about that very issue on Thursday of this week. And, uh, uh, and our analysis is, uh, you know, social emotional learning has been an, is an important uh, part of this. 
uh, and it is more present. In fact, the commissioners and uh, and uh, Castle, which is the group that will coordinate SEL, have a partnership where they they say they're systematically trying to integrate it. Uh, on the change front, and this is why we've gone for the more integrated model of strategy, the six C's and the four learning designs and the infrastructure, is the tendency and change in the US, just stick with this, is to um, silo everything. So here's SEL is great, let's take it, uh, let's legislate it, as you said, let's measure it. And so it, it, what becomes a fundamentally good idea becomes a albatross for the systems already overloaded to start trying to figure out this part too. There is a way of, first of all, wrong driver thinking, don't do it this way, hammer home at the critique before it happens. And secondly, do it a different way where SEL isn't this siloed bolted on solution, it's integrated into well-being and learning. We know how to do that. And schools that we're working with and systems are doing that. It's harder, uh, I guess in one way, but my, my optimism is it's harder to fail. That is, it's more painful to fail than it is to succeed. So I'm hoping that if we can make success clearer, more experiential, then we will get a breakthrough on this. And the way to do this is make sure you do not allow legislators to easily get away with formulating SEL as a bolted on solution. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Um, Rosemary, we got your question and that's good to have you on the call. What she says is she says that we know that deep learning is grounded in opportunities for students to do work that has purpose and that may contribute to important changes in the world. Her question is uh, how do we proceed in what seems like a progressive curriculum agenda in a country that wants or requires more value neutral curriculum? Um, yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, did you want to finish something on it? No, go ahead. Okay, yeah, a, a great question. And I think um, uh, it's, I mean, what, what, what these questions are happily reflecting is that uh, all of our experiences in the last 12 months are bringing home to roost these uh, big problems that were there, were talked about, but not at the level of uh, transparency as that we're getting at. So I don't think that the US is homogeneous and, and it, you know, it's too big and too complex to think of it that way. And, uh, and I think um, what happened on January 6th in the Capitol and what all the spin-offs and discussion are there's a huge problem of two separate entities, at least two. And I want to introduce uh, uh, one concept that we've used that I think is helpful and, and uh, should be used on a big basis. And that concept is impressive empathy. We all know what empathy is. Empathy is understanding where someone is coming from. Impressive empathy is when you try to understand where someone is coming from and they're in your way. That's why it's impressive. And uh, I think what, what uh, President Biden is trying to do and, and probably uh, you know, the ed new education secretary is saying and doing, will do I hope, is to uh, try to figure out through the empathetic pathways and then the concrete uh, solutions to change some people's minds. And it's gonna take you know, that divisiveness you can say goes back 200 years, so I'm not talking about being superficial about this, but I wanna say it this way, we are starting today, yesterday and tomorrow into a journey of change where education and learning is going to be the, uh, the proactive um, contributor to a new society compared to being on the receiving end of a bad society, of what the bad society dishes up. So I think of it that way, and I think uh, I think we will uh, we will need to uh, we'll need to tackle this. This is uh, education. I want to say it this way: learning is not value neutral. Education is about improving the lot of an individual, but more than that, if you think of it, one this is the way I'm thinking of it right now: education is about improving society. And the good thing is that students we haven't found a student young enough, uh, five year olds, I'll say. Uh, who doesn't want to be a change agent, who doesn't realize the world is in trouble. They can feel it in their, in their daily, in their bones, their, their, their anxiety has gone up. So I think of young people as 50% a bundle of nerves and 50% as change agents. 
And so uh, our, if we can, and the six C's tap in to the proactivity of students, that the good news is that's the way they want to learn. What they will learn is deeper. They're not just going to change, superficially change the world. They need to have knowledge. And what, they, what the six C's does is produce the combination individually and collectively to do something about it. I know that's an hypothesis because it's not done yet, but I have a promising kind of feeling the way that it's formulated here that we will have people uh, uh, carrying over into the positive side of that equation and not just giving up and saying it's, it's hopeless uh, because, uh, and this is really the end of our driver's paper where I link into there's a, um, a complexity science and scientist in Canada whose name is Tomer Homer Dixon, Thomas Homer Dixon, who's written three big books on complexity science. And the last one he, uh, he wrote that just was published six weeks ago is called uh, Commandeering Hope, where he says hope has become hopeless. But when we think of the combination of things that are locking us in, it is so, so difficult to get out of it that the only thing that's going to help us initially is to discover some degree of hope, hopefulness that's tied into new experiences. I've called it learned hopefulness, mm -hmm. that what we need is learned hopefulness. What we've got is experienced hopelessness. Let's change experienced hopelessness to learned hopelessness. I like that. Mrs. Grimes? Thank you. Uh, that's a powerful notion, learned hopefulness. Thank you. Uh, I will ask the question from Dennis Kowalski. Uh, given the focus on being mindful of well-being, having students feel meaning, purpose, belonging, safety with a matrix of social relationships, how do we guide staff to know and apply this well-being? And a strong emphasis on a, a secondary component to that question, how do school leadership guide the well-being for staff? So a few things that are, uh, I mean, the more you get into, our, I call it a, a simplexity model because we think it's complex, but it's doable. Uh, I think the more you get into that, you more you see uh, that, um, and we have whole school districts doing this now, I think Ottawa Catholic District, 83 schools in, in, a, in Ontario and many others like that. And once, uh, once uh, teachers and, and some of their leaders start to define the agenda, as well-being and learning. So remember, learning is there. It's not just well-being. Learning is getting good at life, uh, and uh, and 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 really getting good at learning of how to continue to do that. Then the teachers have to shift from their older role of being a, an individualistic dispenser of knowledge to the new role of being a collective subgroup, small group, working with students who are more proactive. And teachers actually, uh, it's like start small, think big is another one of our sticky things. That start small uh, or go slow, go fast is a better one. So go slow, go fast. People find it awkward at the beginning because they're not used to it, but then it kicks in uh, that, that uh, you know, start slow, that's six months. And then six months later it kicks in and they can't get enough of the good, uh, the good part about it. This requires teachers to be starting to act differently this way. I gave you the collaborative, uh, uh, efficacy uh, examples, and that it requires leaders to participate as learners in helping to uh, establish that. Leaders being teacher leaders and being um, school principals and being district superintendents. And so I'm hoping that uh, those leaders, uh, uh, which are, and I don't think it should be just a, a, a mobilization of an army of top-down leaders doing the, trying to do the right thing. This is the mobilization of the bottom upward, but it, but it has to be led. It just doesn't happen by giving permission. It has to be cultivated. So that's the dynamic, I think, of, uh, of the next uh, probably five years, but let's say it can start uh, post-pandemic, uh, we call it approximately, which let's say is in the fall of 2021. Thank you, Dr. Fullen. Uh, Dr. Valencia Cade, and I'm, I apologize if I mispronounced your name, um, has, uh, First of all, thanks you for all of your work, Dr. Fullen, but also um, you have uh, outlined a significant um, component of well-being as a, as a, as a, a system changer. And, and the question is, uh, do you have some examples of where districts have done this well and what does that look like? Uh, yeah, we have, um, we have examples of it. Even the one I showed you, the videotape from Uruguay, Uruguay 
that's the system. I'm talking now about the policy at the, at the national level in Uruguay, the work, people we work with there, uh, and the, the same with the regional and the school principals and those that what, what you saw in that video was precisely well-being thriving. It was exactly that. And so, uh, so that's an example. And you can then say, well, how do they get that far? Uh, and it didn't take that long. It took some leadership and insight to do it. Uh, but having said that, I can, uh, I can take you, I mentioned Ottawa Catholic School District, 83 schools. Uh, in nuance, I have a 10 page case study that where Ottawa is describing how it got that way. Uh, and so I think, uh, I think these examples and in our, in our uh, 10 countries, we have, uh, I think we've identified uh, about 2,500 schools or units that are working on this. And then our, go to our website, npdl.global. So NPL, npdl.global. You have, we have a lot of video clips in there. So seeing it is what you, uh, what you, uh, what you see developed there. But uh, I, was, I was just watching actually an interview with the, one of the great um, new economists. Uh, she's 55 years old, so not, a, not brand new uh, that way. Her name is Mariana Mazzucato. And she's uh, born in Italy. She works now in, in London at one of the university. And she wrote a great book on uh, one of the four, uh, well, the three particular economists I'm thinking of that I drew upon for the right drivers, showing how, uh, how austerity can be turned into prosperity. Uh, but she wrote a new book that's just coming out, just literally came out this month, that's called Mission Economy, uh, the, uh, a moonshot. So she's making the analogy, she said, what's the change we're talking about here is analogous to when President Kennedy in 1961 or so uh, talked about the moonshot and what was involved. She said, that's the kind of change we're talking about, a transformation of the country. And she said, the moonshot was never, here's the 10 steps to implementation. It was mobilizing people to do strands of innovation and then to converge and build and so forth. Uh, so uh, I think this is like that. That is, we are talking about, uh, we, now, we now know what snippets of, uh, of, of success look like. But if let's say uh, Ottawa is highly successful, let's say any of the districts that we're working with, some of them are, have 150 schools, let's say they're successful. The answer will be not, what did they do? Let's replicate it. The answer will be, how do we get informed by this? But uh, Mariana herself said, there's no substitute for rolling up your sleeves and helping to create this. The conditions for doing that now, she said, are better, but you can't theorize about this only. You have to do it. And uh, informed doing is what I'm talking about. So it's a challenge. Yeah. And just to expand on that, Dr. Fulman, I was just thinking while you were talking. So what have you seen that would be some of the typical barriers that prevent that from happening? Uh, I think the, uh, the, bar the barriers are uh, 150 years of school and school system culture which is you know, uh, the student as passive learner, teachers as atom, uh, atomistically involved, and there's some exceptions to that, but basically that's, that's the broad trend. Uh, the barriers are the, uh, the, the size of the uh, shift in mindset that would have to occur among policymakers, mm -hmm. where, uh, where we haven't had that kind of leadership. If you look across the countries now, I'm not just thinking about you, uh, that the leadership in the last 10 years has been absolutely wrong for this solution. And I see as part of all, it's almost to me a question of evolution that things get so bad that something has to happen and that we will see the emergence of leaders now that will require, uh, that, that will think differently and, and, and do the things that we're talking about today. So I think there's huge barriers <clears throat> at the top, uh, failure to think about and do the right things investments, uh, attitudes towards policy assessment, all of those things. But we are seeing definite takers at the other two levels, <clears throat> school level and district level. There are takers and there's success. So that's a start, but we're not, the big barrier is that the system isn't changing at the third level. Thank you. Mrs. Grimes. Thank you. I think this next question um, builds on, on that last quite well. Uh, Dan Keenan asked, uh, is this uh, accountability and testing about trust or mistrust? Uh, and his question is, it can be argued that over, our over-testing has been a cataclysmic failure 
Do you see an attractive alternative that can be used as a lever that provides both formative value for educators and trust for the greater community? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> uh, I mean, trust is the issue is the uh, one of the key underlying issues of change. I don't know whether you've seen um, uh, Robert Putnam's latest book. He, he did it with a co-author. Uh, it's called Upswing, and it was published three months ago, maybe. And in it, they have uh, analyzed the evolution of uh, America for uh, the last 200 years, and they've they've used the uh, phrase to capture the periods, what they called uh, the, the I-we dynamic. So uh, I'm in this for myself, that's I-ness. We're in this together, that's we-ness. And they show that it started in 1890 and that back where they started. And they've got various kind of good empirical evidence that there was a strong sense of uh, we-ness or I-ness that was started. And then there was a strong conversion to a degree of we-ness that led up to the First World War. And then certainly, uh, uh, you see the dynamics in a, another way. I'm being too facile here saying this, but there was a lot of weeness in the U.S. Uh, from 1950 to 1975, and a lot of uh, I-ness from 1980 to the present, increasingly so. And one of the figures they have is uh, what's people's perception of social trust? And the dramatic finding is that, and you can predict this, you could probably give me the numbers, is that 50 years ago, social trust was at a level of 60, 60, 65%. And now it's plummeted to 30% uh, over those periods. So social trust has dived. And, uh, and, uh, and, that, and social trust is key to the solutions we're talking about. So I think this is now the, uh, the time to reestablish uh, trust. If we go back to your accountability, if you pull back from the wrong kind of narrow testing and obsession with that. And you replace it with a healthy investment in um, well-being and the measures that go with it. I'm talking now micro uh, engagement, uh, well-being, you know, in terms of, uh, of, of positive, uh, positive uh, psychology and uh, learning and so things like that. If you replace that, and then you add to that formative uh, evaluation and feedback, which is absolutely necessary for teachers to get better at the pedagogy. So we're, now, we're not external yet, we're investing uh, internal. And then you begin to, uh, into, you get that uh, on the move. And then you, what you do is uh, add the uh, external assessment, but instead of making it as simplistically the driver that's going to give us high literacy, numeracy and everything else, instead of doing that, you say our assessment is going to be able to mark, not try to evaluate children every level all the time, all the time, because that's a massive backfire. We know that. Mm -hmm. Let's have, but we need something. So we need to be able to measure, uh, uh, you know, uh, we need to be able to measure uh, engagement and, and health and learning. That's one part. Last point, sorry to take so long on this. The uh, direct answer to your question is in addition to having new formative assessment, we need new assessment that will, um, qualitatively assess in each individual student's capacity in terms of the competencies we're talking about. So I, again, in district I was uh, dealing with the other day, US district, big district, massive, big size. They have uh, what they call skills backpack and they assess students at uh, year five, year eight and year 12. And these students prepare in relation to those skills and their teachers prepare it what are we, what have we learned and what we're good at? And they have to demonstrate externally to a, to a panel or a group, whatever, what have we learned in relation to these? So now they've combined formative assessment with accounting for yourself externally in terms of the skills I've learned. And you can wrap around that other kinds of me measure. So I, do, I don't have the solution yet, but I would say about external assessment, let's do um, a lot less of it. Let's make sure that it is there though periodically to be able to do that. And let's have the qualitative outcomes, which we know we can demonstrate. They're a little harder to measure, but they're not impossible to measure. People are measuring them all the time in our group. And, uh, and we've had to re recalibrate at that. Uh, so I'm, I'm convinced that if we build up that formative assessment, we will be in a position to be deal with external assessment much better, but that remains to be developed and figured. And it's, there's a lot of politics in there. So I'm not saying it's simple, but you won't get to the moon by doing something.
So thanks. Thank you, Dr. Fullen. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Massachusetts model, but uh, Jim Lloyd, and he's a very deep thinker, um, says that, uh, asked the question about uh, whether we could emulate um, a um, model that they have in, in Massachusetts that would be maybe a holistic measurement for uh, students. I don't know if you know about that or have any um, um, background on that, but uh, what might that do to uh, us and giving us an opportunity to maybe look at things holistically? I think it's a good idea. I don't know. I worked in Massachusetts back and forth and there's a lot of promise there. So I, I'm not surprised that they're on the right track. I, I think the one caution I would make is let's not think of the holistic model as the single replacement for, uh, for the bad testing. Let's think of building up the inner workings of the system so that the holistic model is just a, 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 an extension and a confirmation that the system is in fact like that. It's for reaffirming and reaffirming the system and re uh, uh, putting more additional stimulus into the system not to look for the magic answer of the external assessment uh, because that's going to be too distracting thank you mrs grimes Okay, I'm new here. Uh, your research continues to illuminate the significance of an ethical humanist need for educators that leverages an action for stakeholders to take in the change we want to see. What do you foresee as the most challenging variable involved in reimagining the new educational landscape? I think if you go to that, uh, what you call the ethical, another way of thinking about this, and I am you know, engaged in this, you know, my own analysis and thinking, if, if you take uh, evolution and there's you know various people of uh, uh, there's evolutionary biologists and there's a lot of kind of controversy about how you end up with it uh, but there's uh, if you take evolution there's kind of uh, an analysis to be made that we are losing the ground to uh, the possibility of humanity survival and you can blame it on God, or you can blame it on evolution, whatever you want to do. It in fact is we're going down a path of denouement. And I think, uh, and uh, you know, Edward Wilson, who's one of the biologists that I, I study, said uh, something like, uh, we have overestimated uh, uh, what, we've overestimated science and, and you know, machines in terms of our, our, our evolution, and we've underestimated humans. So if we take that equation, then I think one of the promising things, and this is why the contribution to the world is quite a theme, is I think there are, there's an attraction on the part of young people and a lot of others to do something worthwhile. I don't mean charity work. I mean, just like uh, engage the world, change the world means you engage the world to learn about it, but you're also part of parcel of thinking about it. So I think the improvement part is in real time. And the way in which, uh, if you just take collaboration, you can collaborate to destroy the world as well as collaborate to save it. So collaboration per se is that it's the it's the ethical basis of it, and you can find different ethical bases that I think coincide. Some of them perhaps are religion or not. Some of them are certainly human in my terms, the human evolution. There are, we have the cognitive science working with us, a neuroscientist, and there's there's no when I ask her, are humans born to be uh, to think about others? And she said, absolutely, yes. Like after, after six, uh, six hours, you can see that, or there's a lot of documentation. But then they might, uh, they might evolve to uh, uh, grow up in isolation, to grow up in destructive groups, whatever the variable is, it's human, it's the social variable. So I wanted, I wanted to think that human evolution has a bias towards ethical collaborative betterment for all. I think it has a bias. I'm talking about evolution, evolution now, that is the likelihood that the that the conditions are there if we can just start to leverage them, and so I'm I'm not thinking even religious religious I'm thinking of, uh, you know the uh, existential problem probability that we need for our own good individually and collectively to work on this agenda, and that there will be takers and that will cause the uh, what I call the 50% uh, bundle of nerves and 50% saving the world to have a combination that's more towards the improving improving things, not as an altruistic uh, action by itself, 
but as part and parcel of what it is to be meaningful in this world. Thank you, Dr. Fulham. We've got about uh, 30 seconds. I got a real quick question, and I think this has implications for uh, a lot of folks on this call. I'm just curious as to what recommendations you would give higher education to how they might change the preparation for leaders and teachers as we move forward. And again, we've got about another maybe a minute. It, just a couple of suggestions that you think for higher education and what we might do differently to prepare teachers and leaders. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a three hour question in 60 seconds. So uh, I, I, yeah, I, I think, um, I think partnering with school systems is, uh, is the main thing, particularly if we're talking about this direction now. And therefore, what we, we, we know what doesn't work, which is a bunch of courses on leadership and admin type things uh, that need to be, uh, they need to actually have be embedded in this work. And embedded means, I think, really uh, strong partnerships with school systems, higher ed and school system. I think it also is looking at the entrance into post-secondary which if you looked at the research, there's a few a whole bunch of questions about how higher education unwittingly or otherwise is uh, not an equitable proposition. And therefore you have to uh, think so, the book that uh, Paul Tuff wrote and, uh, and and a couple of others, they're just really very bad analysis of or at least they point to bad things where that uh, people who are disadvantaged have a hard time getting success, being sex, successful. Lastly, I just want to say this, because uh, I meant to say it, is one of the things we've discovered in deep learning is that deep learning is good for all students, but it's especially good for students that are disconnected. They find in deep learning a way of doing this, that vocational and technical education finds a easy home in the, in the global competencies. So there's ways in which I think we can get students who are disadvantaged to be more successful by the changes I'm talking about. Thank you, Dr. Fulman.